Good evening. Uh, welcome to the SPS seminar series. I'm Irina paxinova fiadu I'm a third-year SPS student, and I'll be chairing the event today. Uh, we have the pleasure of having with us one of our own scholars. Um, we have Professor Kate Pickett. Professor Pickett is the co-author of The Spirit Level and is currently teaching at the Department of Health Sciences at our university. Um, we will start by uh, having a 30-minute, 40-minute presentation by Kate and then we will have time for questions. And without further delay, I'll give you Kate Pickett. Thank you. Thanks very much, Irina, and thank you for the invitation to come and talk to you, and thank you all for showing up on this very, very dark, gloomy evening. Tonight, what I want to do, or this evening, what I want to do is, is talk to you a little bit about how research on inequality has developed um, since we wrote The Spirit Level. My co-author, Richard Wilkinson, is actually here today at the front. Um, he's, for once, not travelling. And so when we get to the discussion and, and question and answer time, um, I hope he'll participate. Um, but for those of you, I'm not going to assume, arrogantly, that you've all read our book, so I will give a, a, a little synopsis of, of what it contains. But really, I want to spend the time on, on new research and where that research is, is taking our thinking um, and how the field is developing. Um, not usually a problem with an academic audience, but a lot of people don't like statistics. And our work is empirical and you know, relies on, on correlations and empirical evidence. But if you can understand this chart, you can understand what our book says. Um, in it, we look at a whole range of health and social problems, um, relate them to income inequality, and show that as societies become more unequal, their prevalence of health and social problems increases. And really, it started with trying to understand what this chart is telling us. If you're sitting at the back, it will just look like a cloud of grey smoke, but these are the names of different countries. We have life expectancy up the side, ranging from 40 to 80, plotted against a measure of national income per person, so gross national income per person, the material living standards of the average person in those societies. And you can see that in the early stages of economic growth, as countries get just a little bit richer, as standards of living rise, health, um, life expectancy increases very, very rapidly. But once you get beyond a certain point, it all starts to level out. And the richer a country gets, um, you don't see any expected benefit in terms of life expectancy. And if we look at other measures of well-being or happiness, we see the same pattern. Rapid increases in the early stages of economic growth, and then this plateauing out, and no further increases as countries get richer and richer. So we often say that you know, what we're really seeing is that we have come to the end of what economic growth can do for us in terms of improving population health and well-being. And if we look at time series data for countries like the US and the UK, over time we can see that um, well-being and happiness have not improved as economic growth has continued. So it's really trying to understand what are the drivers of health and well-being in those countries where we've lost the relationship between the improvement in material living standards and health. And so here are those countries that are on that top, flat, right-hand part of the previous graph. These are the rich market democracies in the world. And again, we're looking at life expectancy. Here we're going from 76 to 82. Again, plotting life expectancy for men and women against national income per person, and there's no relationship whatsoever. So that we have rich countries like the Nor Norway and the USA with very different life expectancies, and again, poorer countries with, with different experiences. There's the UK right in the middle. And yet we all know that within every single one of those societies, there is a social gradient in health. Income does matter for health within every single one of those societies. And here are data showing that for England and Wales. These are 
Again, life expectancies from 70 to 80 for electoral wards in England and Wales. And they're ranked by deprivation. Here are the most affluent, wealthy societies this end and the most deprived over here. And there's a gap in life expectancy. We've got life expectancy about 71 and a half in the most deprived wards and over 79 in the most affluent. So a huge social injustice, a huge gap in life expectancy related to deprivation in England and Wales, but it's not just a difference between the poor and the rest of us. It's a finely graded relationship, a gradient where if you live in the second most wealthy or affluent neighbourhoods, your life expectancy is on average a little bit lower than if you live in the very most affluent. So that paradox that income means nothing between societies, average income means nothing, but income within societies is very important, tells us that it's something about rank, something about relative income that matters, rather than absolute um, income or access to material wealth. And we had been working for a long time on... Um, health-related issues. Both Richard and I are social epidemiologists. Um, Richard, obviously, <coughs> with a long career looking at the effects of income inequality in relation to health. But we started, when working together, to think that if health is affected by social position, by rank, by status, then a lot of other social problems might be as well. Because they also have that social gradient. You know, they're more common at the bottom of society, but they have that gradient and they're a little bit more common close to the top than they are at the very top. So things like educational attainment, um, teenage pregnancies, the level of violence in a society, how many people are in prison, social mobility, um, a whole range of issues as well as a lot of health problems. So we created an index of health and social problems for different um, rich developed countries. And it includes the following things. It includes measures of health, life expectancy, infant mortality, obesity, mental illness, which includes drug and alcohol addiction. It also includes things um, that economists would call human capital, um, social mobility, how well children do in school, um, teenage births but also measures of social cohesion. So we've got trust, we've got homicides, and we've got imprisonment. And we collected data on all of those factors for each of these different countries, put it all into one index, and here we're plotting it again against average um, income per person. So if you're higher up on the chart, you're doing worse, you have more health and social problems. If you're lower down, you're doing better. And just as with life expectancy, there's no significant relationship between average incomes and this index of health and social problems. But if instead we plotted against a measure of income distribution, the gap between the rich and the poor, we get a very, very different picture. So here's that same index of um, health and social problems. So nobody's moved their vertical position but now we're plotting that index against a measure of income inequality, and it's a strong, highly significant correlation. Um, so we've got Japan, Norway, um, Finland, Netherlands, Denmark down here, with a much lower level of health and social problems, and the more unequal societies, UK, Portugal, and the USA, with a much higher level. So what's that measure of income inequality across the bottom? We use the ratio between the incomes of the top fifth of the population and the bottom fifth. Um, so it's quite, quite simple and easy to understand. And in the more equal countries, Japan, Finland, Norway, Sweden, we've got um, the, top, the incomes of the top fifth of the population are three and a half to four times those of the incomes at the bottom. And at the more unequal ends, we've got Australia, UK, Portugal, US, they're seven to eight and a half times that of the bottom fifth. 
Now, we knew that this work is controversial, um, has huge political implications, and that some people might think that um, the differences we were seeing between different countries are cultural or are, are due to some other factor um, related to, those, to how those different countries are. So we repeated the whole analysis with the 50 states of the USA. So we created the same index of health and social problems for the 50 states. Um, here again, they're, doing, they're worse, um, doing worse if they're near the top, doing better if they're near the bottom, and plotted it against a measure of income inequality for the 50 states. So in, in a sense, a different test bed for the same hypothesis. So down here at the more equal end, we've got Utah, Wisconsin, Iowa, New Hampshire, doing very well with low levels of health and social problems, Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana up at the top there. And we also knew that some people would think we, we chose the problems we studied um, you know, to suit ourselves. So we did it all again with somebody else's index. This is the UNICEF Index of Child Wellbeing in Rich Countries, um, which UNICEF published in 2007. Got a lot of attention in the UK because for once we would actually do worse than the US and we came absolute bottom. Um, levels of child wellbeing in the UK are, are worse than in any other rich country in this, in this index um, from 2007. So again, a significant relationship between child well-being and income inequality. And this measure of child well-being contains 40 different factors. Everything from whether kids can talk to their parents, whether they eat five fruits and vegetables a day, have they been immunised, are they bullied at school, how well do they get on with their peers, a whole, a whole range of factors. So we saw this impact of income inequality across a range of health and social problems in different settings and whether we look at adults or, or whether we look at children. So that's sort of the main message of the book. But we also made the point that even for those near the top of society, even for those who are most educated, have the highest incomes, um, the, the highest social class, they have a lower risk of health and social problems living in a more equal society. Now, at the time we published The Spirit Level, there wasn't a huge amount of evidence in, in this area. Um, these are data from an analysis that Richard and I published in the American Journal of Public Health, where we're looking at um, death rates for working age men and women, high up here, in relation to the median household income, the average household income in different counties of the US. And we're comparing the most equal states to the most unequal states. And you can see that whether or not you live in a poor county or a rich county, you have a lower mortality risk in the more equal states, you know, right across the spectrum. And we had a few pieces of evidence similar to that um, here's one for um, educational attainment. This is literacy scores of 16 to 25 year olds, so how well young people are doing in literacy. And their scores are ordered in relation to their parents' education, how educated their parents are. Um, and we've got Sweden, the most equal of these three countries here, Canada, which comes in about the middle of the income inequality distribution, and the USA, the most unequal of these. In every case there is a gradient. You know, your, your literacy scores are lower if your parents have a lower level of education. But both the gradient and the level are affected by the inequality in society. So we've got the steepest gradient um, and the lowest levels in the most unequal country and the shallowest gradient and the highest levels in the most equal of those. And I'm very glad that tonight one of my doctoral students, um, Philippa Bird, is here. And Pippa has just submitted her dissertation. We'll have her viva next month. Um, and Pippa has been taking this kind of idea forward and looking at measures of child health. And in particular, we've been interested in measures of child health that are good predictors of lifelong health and social well-being. So we've looked at height and cognitive development, 
um, and behavioural problems um, across a lot of different cohorts. And although there's some variation in our findings, I think the overall message is, is that this, this is a pattern that fits a lot of child development outcomes across different countries. So not only does income inequality raise the average level of problems in societies, but it is affecting the whole population. So I think when we published our book, we were um, convinced that what we were seeing was a causal relationship. But initially, of course, our book met with some strong criticism mostly, I would say, from politically, um, ideologically driven opposition to it, um, but most of the questions being around whether or not the relationships we were showing could be causal or not. So I want to spend a, a little bit of time thinking about that and how our thinking about that um, has developed over the years. In epidemiology... We can't do experiments, you know, we can't manipulate um, income inequality in different countries and wait, you know, a number of years and then find out what's happened. Um, we're reliant instead on observational methods and on looking at a whole body of evidence to tell us whether or not it's reasonable to assume that something is causal. So we have... Um, a set of causal criteria in epidemiology that we use when we're looking at the literature as a whole. Um, and these, these are the main things that we, we think about. We look at the strength of the association and, and a dose-response effect. You know, if inequality gets higher, you know, do you see a step change in health and social problems? How strong is that correlation? And I'm not going to spend time on that because that, that one's really well established. As societies get more unequal, things get worse. The correlations are often extremely strong, more for some outcomes than others, but, but there's, there's a, lot, a lot of robust evidence here. And the reason this is a criteria is because if you see this strong dose-response relationship, it's less likely that something else might be explaining the relationship. There's also um, issues around consistency. Do you see the same pattern in, in different places or with different study designs? There's also the absolute need to establish the temporal sequence. Is it income inequality or changes in income inequality that cause health and social problems, or is there some reverse causality there? We need to think about the plausibility and coherence um, of what we're looking at when we're lucky, although we might not be able to experiment, we will be able to look at societies where income inequality has changed a lot and see what effect that has, so exposure has changed. And then, of course, there are alternative explanations. I'm going to go very, very quickly through these so I can get on to the new research. We've shown consistency by showing that things um, work the same in the rich countries and in the American states. So here's trust, levels of trust, the percent of people who think others can be trusted in more equal countries, two-thirds, compared to the more unequal, less than a fifth, and the exact same pattern in the United States. Um, two-thirds in the more equal states, less than a third in the more unequal states. And we've got studies of income inequality and health from the regions of Chile, from parts of China, from the Eastern European countries, and, and all of that is giving us a consistent picture. In terms of temporality, there was a meta-analysis um, by Condé and colleagues published um, after our book was published, but in the same year, that looked at cohort studies where income inequality was measured at the beginning of the study and people's experiences of mortality thereafter. And in this meta-analysis, we get an overall statistically significant um, effect of income inequality measured years before and mortality later on. And we're now starting to see some good time series evidence that although income inequality doesn't have an instantaneous effect on mortality, 
It begins to exert its influence about five years after it changes, peaking at seven years and then then starting to diminish. And we're also seeing um, evidence that the same is true for crime. We've recently published a paper with a colleague at the Equality Trust showing that as income inequality changes, crime rates change. And we see this for both property crime and homicide rates. So we are, we are getting that evidence of um, the causal um, pathways working in the right direction. The plausibility, the sort of coherence of this picture is down to what we think is, is underpinning it. And that is all to do with a theory of social comparisons, our sensitivity to status, our status anxiety, what rank does to us. And I think this is where, you know, it helps very much that we came at this from a perspective of being social epidemiologists because the field of social epidemiology has shown us how important social status itself is for health, how important social connections are, um, the friends we have, the social support we have, social capital, and how important um, the psychosocial context of our early childhood is as well. And all of these psychosocial factors affect both our behavior, our biology, um, the way we think, and our emotions as well. And so where you feel you might place yourself on a ladder, thinking about the top of society to the bottom, where you feel you come here um, has a strong impact on your health. And we're starting to understand that very well through the biology of chronic stress. Um, I'm torn between wanting to spend a bit of time on evidence of that and torn between wanting to get on to the to the new stuff. How long did you want me to talk for, Brian? You've got another 20 minutes at least. Yeah, okay. So so we'll go through it. You can just wave wave at me if you want me to stop. Um, so again, when we published our book, we were drawing on the work, particularly of psychologists, experimental work that was helping us to understand these psychosocial processes and their, their impact on our biology, on our health, on our feelings and thinking. Um, and one piece of evidence that I think was really useful is the work of Dickerson and Khomeini, who are psychologists in California, And they conducted a meta-analysis, an overview of studies, experiments, where psychologists had brought subjects into the laboratory um, and given them stressful tasks to do and then measured to see how their stress hormones responded because they were trying to understand what kinds of stressors most stress us as human beings. And what they found was that it was tasks with what they call social evaluative threat that provoke the biggest response. And what they mean by that is tasks in which other people can judge you negatively. So if I brought you all into a lab and gave you difficult maths problems to do, you might find it a little bit stressful, but you'd find it a whole lot more stressful um, if I made you read out your results to everybody else in the room. So it's, so it's where other people can judge you, and it's this sense that we judge ourselves through the eyes of others. And these are the, these are the kinds of tasks that most um, increase our stress levels. And very quickly, another example of that, really, but more about um, cognition than, than physiology. Researchers at the World Bank worked with Indian schoolboys again, in sort of a lab setting, classroom setting, gave them puzzles to do, those mazes where you have to find your way from the outside into the middle. Um, And when the boys did this, without knowing one another's cast, the high cast and the low cast boys did equally well. But after they had had to announce their cast to one another, the performance of the low cast boys plummeted. And psychologists call this... um, stereotype threat, if you feel that the group you belong to is stigmatized and stereotyped in negative ways by other people, then that 
suppresses your performance. And we see the same for African-American versus white students in, in America performing equally well on tests until told that it's a test of intelligence and provoking that stereotype threat in the black students. And I'm afraid, ladies, we do the same when it's tests of maths and spatial problems. We do fine unless we're told that science has shown that women do worse than men and then our performance plummets. In fact, we're so sensitive to this that we only have to tick a box at the top of the paper to say male or female to, to provoke that particular response. Um, and here an experiment from monkeys. I know these are monkeys but not people, but you could not do this experiment with students. We've got monkeys um, housed on their own for a while by researchers, um, and then they're scanning their brains, and this is a non-technical biological talk, so we'll say they're looking for happy chemicals. Okay? And then the monkeys are moved into groups and allowed to establish a social hierarchy, and then their brains are scanned again. Now, here are the monkeys who are going to become dominant in social groups, but here they're living on their own. They've got quite a little bit of happy chemicals, a little bit more than the monkeys that are going to go on to become subordinate monkeys, um, but are now living on their own. But not much difference between the two. And then after they're socially housed and have formed their social ranks, the dominant monkeys' um, brains are very, very happy. They are really benefiting from being top monkey. It's not good to be bottom monkey. Um, but the monkeys that have become subordinate are not benefiting at all from their living in groups. Um, now, you could do that with students if you had enough halls of residence and could, could move them around enough, but you couldn't do the next bit because then the researchers allowed the monkeys to take cocaine. They had free access to cocaine. They taught them how to use it. And um, these monkeys didn't bother. Okay? They didn't need it, but these monkeys took a lot and afterwards their brains looked like these brains. So those monkeys were medicating themselves against their, their social pain. So this was the sort of, of body of evidence that we had that fit with things we were looking at, like the relationship between income inequality and drug use, um, that helped us to sort of try and understand those, those different pathways. I'm going to skip over alternative explanations, and we can come to those later. Um, oops, what did I do there? And on yeah. cessation of exposure, we do have one good example. Remember I showed you the index of health and social problems in relation to income inequality? And Japan was the most equal country in our data set and had the lowest level of health and social problems. And the USA had the highest level of income inequality um, and the highest level of health and social problems. That's what it looks like um, now. But if we'd looked at the same data, if it had been possible, just after World War II, <coughs> the picture would have been entirely different. The USA was much, much more equal, did much, much better in terms of health problems in relation to other countries, um, and Japan would have been at the other end of the distribution. And of course, one thing that I think helps you believe that um, your theory and your, your evidence um, is true is if you can predict what, what future data will look like. When we first started studying mental illness in relation to income inequality, this is the percentage of adults with any mental illness in relation to income inequality, we didn't have a lot of data for a lot of countries. And indeed, people argued we actually shouldn't even try and do a regression here because we had, um, in a sense, two different data sets. But um, as more data came in, it filled in that gap very, very nicely um, in line with what we would have predicted. And the same was true for social mobility, where we only started out having data for eight countries because you need long data series to be able to do this. Um, a big gap between some <coughs> European countries um, and the UK and the USA, but as more data came out, again, more able to fill in that picture. But I want to spend the last bit of time on, on new research. 
um, that's helping really to fill out the picture. And we've seen this, this massive growth in research on income inequality since 2009, really in two areas. One set of studies that are looking at societal levels of inequality, just as we have in the past, so levels of income inequality in relation to a whole range of what we might think of as the psychosocial states of being that then will lead to health and social problems. Um, also, more research on mental illness in particular, but also a surprising body of research that's really looking at civic participation and cultural partic participation, which is showing us that people who live in more equal societies are more likely to take part in civic life and more likely um, to take part in cultural events and cultural life. It's as if in more, more equal societies there's less of an us and them about who does what and, and who attends what, what kinds of things. And then also some research that looks at individual people and looks at social class um, in relation to their social behaviour. So I'm going to show you just a few examples um, of things that, that fit here. There is a new paper coming out that shows that status anxiety, which is at the heart of what we think is, is happening when societies become more unequal, status anxiety increases in more and less equal, more unequal societies. But I can't show you a figure from that because the, the data are not yet published. Um, but I'll show you some other things. When we were asked to take a look at our book and, and produce a new chapter for it after it had been published about a year, one of the things that I did was, was to go and look at what new studies had been published on income inequality and health in different countries, what new international comparisons had been done and I found nine studies at that point and seven of them showed exactly what we had shown worse health in more unequal societies and two of them did not but looking more closely at those two they looked at income inequality in relation to self-rated health and not in relation to a measure like mortality or life expectancy so a subjective measure rather than an objective measure. And we know that within any society, self-rated health is quite a good predictor of mortality and morbidity, but it turns out that in international comparisons, it isn't actually well related to health. So here's the proportion of the population that say their health is good in different countries. Here's Japan, which has the longest life expectancy in the world, but only 54% of the population say their health is good. And here's the USA, with one of the lowest life expectancies of the rich developed nations, but 80% of them say their health is good. So in fact, if you look at um, good self-rated health in relation to income inequality, not only is it not related, but actually the trend is in the other direction that more people say their health is good in more unequal societies, even though we know their actual health is worse. So rather than being a refutation of, of the idea that income inequality affects health, I think we're actually seeing something a lot more interesting here. A tendency in more unequal countries for people to have to present themselves to others as, as better, as healthier. And we speculated that this might be a, um, a, a sort of a, a general trend that, you know, in more unequal countries where status is much more salient and important, you might need to big yourself up more. Um, so we're very pleased to see this piece of research from um, Luffman and colleagues published in 2011, which looked at exactly that. Now we've got income inequality across the bottom again, and a measure of self-enhancement at the side, um, and a strong, significant relationship between the two. And self-enhancement is saying basically that you're better than average. Yeah. Um, so we know that in the USA, 96% of people say they are better drivers than average. 
Yeah? And in Sweden, it's only about 66%. But this measure is looking across a whole range of things. Do you think you're a better driver? Do you think you're more intelligent? Do you think you're better looking? You know, are you healthier? And what we're seeing is this tendency in more unequal countries for people to do more of that self-enhancement, more of that boosting of their self-presentation in societies where status matters more. I'm going to skip that one because it's complicated to explain. Somewhat related, um, we've also been looking at data from Jean Twenge and her colleague Bill Campbell, who are psychologists in America, looking at the rise in narcissism in the United States over recent decades, somewhat related to this idea of um, self-enhancement um, with narcissism, that you know, this is people very much um, self-centered, thinking about themselves, feeling themselves to be better, more important than other people, and importantly, lacking empathy towards others. If you want to know whether or not you're a narcissist, there's loads of websites online where you can log on and do a very, very simple set of questions and find out how narcissistic you are. Um, it's quite a tough one, actually, because they give you paired statements and you have to say which you agree with most. And, for example, there's one that says, I do not like to look in the mirror, versus I love to look in the mirror. You know, and that's a bit black and white, isn't it? Because if you're having a good hair day and you're dressed up to go out, you don't mind looking in the mirror, but other days you'd really rather not. Um, but the one, the one that really got me was the question... Um, the statement said, do you think the world would be a better place if you were in charge? Yeah? <laughs> and I thought, God, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. There's one or two things I'd do right away that would really, really help. But when I told Richard about that, he said, I had no idea of the unintended consequences of the things I would do. <laughs> so he's much less of a narcissist than I am. Um, but actually, the, the paired statement with that was, I would be terrified to be in charge of the world. You know? So I, th I think that's, that's also true. But here, this, this is Twenge and Campbell's data showing narcissism rising over time, and we've plotted it against um, a measure of income inequality in the United States. And you can see the two sort of taking off at around the same time. And in fact, it's almost impossible to use um, ordinary scales of self-esteem in American college populations these days because they all score the maximum. Um, so it's this sense of people really needing to put on a good front, really needing to present themselves as better than average. I'll move now to a couple of studies from um, psychologists again in California called PIF, who, rather than looking at whole populations, is looking at individual people and is experimenting with them um, to find out how social class affects things like their pro-social behaviour, their ethical behaviour, their narcissism, etc. Um, and he does really sort of two kinds of studies. One, one set are observational. Um, and here, he, basically, he and researchers stood at the intersection, um, you know, in a city, and watched cars driving by, and they noted which cars cut off other cars, you know, so behaved rudely at the intersection. And they noted down each vehicle's um, age and make. And they've classified vehicles as low status up to, up to high status. And they did the same thing at a pedestrian crossing, noticing which cars allowed pedestrians to cross and, and, and which um, illegally ran over the pedestrian crossing. And in both cases, the higher the status of the car the worse the behaviour of the drivers. So rich people were more likely to cut other people off or, or not allow pedestrians to cross the road. But he also did a number of um, experiments um, with, with people in the laboratory. Um, no, sorry, I'll go back on first. Um, setting up people in an experimental situation where they thought that somebody else in the experiment was in distress to see if they helped them, um, giving them um, plausible ethical choices, and finding that high-status people are more likely to behave unethically than others. They're less likely to behave kindly 
towards others. They're more likely to behave in narcissistic ways. I'm afraid they're even more likely to take candy from children. In one experiment, he had a jar of sweets um, and he told the participants, you know, those are really for the children in the lab next door, but if you want, if you want some, you know, go ahead and take some. And the high-status people took far more candy than, than the low-status people. And it all sounds a bit depressing because, you know, you start to think of, of um, rich people behaving in, in completely awful ways and how do you get around that. But I think the most interesting experiment he did was, was this one where he, he was actually measuring narcissistic tendencies, um, but he did it under two conditions. He measured the difference between low and high social class people um, and found the difference that he had been finding all along. And then he did what he, he called a priming exercise with them. He asked them to sit down and write on a piece of paper before they did the experiment um, a few sentences about how they felt about people being treated equally. So it was just a little prime to get them thinking about egalitarianism. And when they did experiments under that condition, the difference between the high social class and the low social class people was, was much reduced. And I think that's a very hopeful and optimistic measure because it suggests that if people are encouraged to think about egalitarianism, are encouraged to think about the benefits of equality, then it actually can change um, the way they behave. I think I'll stop now, because I've talked for long enough, but I, I mean, I do have... I have a lot more slides. Um, but we could talk at some point as well about the work that economists are doing studying income inequality, a lot of which is very new since the global financial crisis and since our book was published, and also the connections that are being made um, between income inequality and the environment and how societies act um, internally and towards others with respect to the environment, because those are also important new areas of research. But perhaps we'll explore that a bit in, in discussion or questions. Thank you Thanks. Very much.